us and to be the manifest presence of, of God Himself on the earth today, indwelling believers in all over the world. And so today, Father, we ask that Your Holy Spirit would be our teacher and as we kind of feed back on some things and we've been learning some things together that You would just uh, really speak into our lives. We pray, Lord Jesus, that Your warrior angels would surround us today. That You would clear our minds uh, from things that might hinder us from just hearing from You today, not from me. And so, Father, we just thank You for Your grace and Your goodness and Your faithfulness to us as the people of God. That You know us by name. You know everything about us. So we come with that strength and that faith today in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the questions I asked the group a few weeks ago was, why don't congregations succeed in their Christ-given mission? And uh, there are some issues around this. One of the things is that we're just not clear on some questions. Uh, what is the mission of the church? Who can lead us to accomplish the mission? And how can we set up leaders to succeed? But the mission of every church is the same. It's the same in every church uh, for all time. It, and sometimes we overlook this and, and we, we miss it. And so why does our church exist? And uh, this is an important question. And I've been in lots of churches. I've talked in front of lots of churches, worked with church leaders over the years. And one, one of the questions that, that we miss out on is why does our church exist? But there's only three possible answers to it. Only three. The first one is, well, the church it, it exists for us. Right? And uh, there are many people that fall into that category. Churches that exist for themselves. They have a very inward focus going on in their lives. It exists for others. Uh, so they, they have an extreme outward focus. And that it exists for both. But then we have to ask the question, who gets served first? The outsider or the insider? And then there's the whole question of, really, what is the main purpose of the church? Which is to... To glorify God. And through this, and through the decision around those three questions, it determines whether we are really glorifying God or not. A vision is a picture of a mission accomplished in the future. That's what a vision is. And then it also has these values that we talked about that are deeply held priorities that uh, either line up with the mission and vision or undermine the mission and vision. And then the structures is how we arrange things. Let me ask you a question this morning. Um, how would you describe a healthy church? Just give me one word. One word. Love. Love, okay. Love is an evidence of a healthy church. What else? Connection. Connection. Okay? That's a great word. Love that word. Serving. Serving. Someone else. Prayer. Okay. What's that? Growth. Growth. Right? Growth. All those things describe a healthy church. There, there's some real strong characteristics that people have done research on. And uh, through natural church development, there are kind of eight things that are shown to be those things that are healthy about a healthy church. They have empowering leadership. So the leadership of the church empowers people to do the work of the ministry. Ephesians chapter 4. They have a gift-oriented ministry where people use their gifts and abilities to, to really just serve together and serve one another. They have a passionate spirituality. So, so they are praying together, they are worshiping together, they're serving together, and their life with Christ makes an incredible difference in their lives. They have functional structures. 
so that they have structures and things that, that are a kind of fluid and flowing so that things get done um, as God leads the people to do those things. They have inspiring worship services, holistic life groups, and those groups are basically different kinds of life groups to help people in different ways to keep growing in their walk with God. Uh, they have need-oriented evangelism. They, they are outreaching in the community, helping to meet needs, while at the same time sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as somebody already said, there are loving relationships in a healthy church. There is love in the house. How's that? So one of the things that's evident, and Jesus said it too, you know, they will know you. Why? By your love for one another. So, so that's an important thing in the life of the church. That we love one another. And all of these things kind of flow out from that as people are transformed by the Lord Jesus Christ. So I said earlier that our mission is very clear. Every church has the same mission. Jesus gives it to us in Matthew 28. He says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Our mission is one command. It's make disciples of all nations. And then there are four, this is a really cool thing, there's kind of four participial phrases that are given there in that those few verses. That's the grammatical term. All the English people will just love. Robin said something really important today. Participial phrases. So, he's, and Jesus is going, or go, and as you're going. And, and that's really about winning. You're seeking the lost and winning them to Christ. It's cultivating and planting and reaping. And uh, Jesus just wants us to be a going people, making a difference, being salt and light in the world. Because one of the things that, that is so true today is that people want to be friends with the friends of Jesus first before they want to be friends with Jesus Christ. They, they want to see the reality of Jesus Christ in your life and mine before they will even come to Christ. They need friends who genuinely know Him. And then Jesus says, well, I want you to baptize these people and this is really about building believers. And Colossians 2 7 says that we are to be rooted and built up in Christ, strengthened in the faith. And so, as people come to Christ, they're baptized, they, they join a local church, and then they are built up in, in the, that, that as a new believer and, and as a believer in Christ. And then we are to teach them to obey. And this is really about equipping people and helping them care for believers and sharing Christ's love with those outside of Christ. So two things Jesus did over and over again as He worked with His disciples and as He, as he led them into ministry was He showed them how to kind of peer care for one another, to love one another, to minister to one another, and then also to peer share, to reach out to those who don't know Christ yet. So our mission is to glorify God by assisting believers to make disciples who make disciples. Then there's our motive out of Mark 12. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Our motive for what we do is always love. Love. And and. In Mark 12, this is one command expressed in two directions. Loving God to prayer and word and worship. Our hearts are just caught up in the love of God. And then loving others through fellowship and outreach and care. It's all about intentional relationships. Jesus' strategy was this. He had an intentional relationship with His Heavenly Father. And He had intentional relationships with others around Him. So here's a couple of questions that I have for you. Those of you who are in life groups can use these questions this week. And, and just ask these questions. Because when we're in fellowship with one another, 
when we're growing in faith with one another, we can ask these questions. What is God doing in your life? What is God doing? <coughs> Gwen and I can share some things. We can share some things right here, right now, about what God is doing in our life. Even though there's hard things going on. How, how did God show Himself to you this week? Do you ever look for that? How, how, did, how did God show up in your life, in your work, in your family, or in the things that you're doing? How did He show up? What's the next step in your relationship with Jesus? Have you ever shared that with somebody? I, I believe my next step with Jesus is this. It's this. Even though we're going through things, Jesus is always leading us on to the next step. Our motive, clearly, is love. Our mission is to make disciples. We're going, we're baptizing, we're teaching, and we're seeing people multiply in God's kingdom. God's chosen method out of Ephesians chapter 3 is His church. And the local church is God's system for making disciples. The church is to help people walk as Jesus did. And the agenda for anyone in church leadership is this, is to help people move to God's agenda so that they can live a balanced biblical lifestyle. Our structure, our programming, what we do, it helps people to live that balanced biblical lifestyle or, or not. And so, as a church, our leadership team is really on top of this, wanting us to, to help guide this congregation to move on to God's agenda in every aspect of our life. So this can be broken down to just Jesus' healthy strategy. And what is it? Well, it's winning lost people to Christ. Do you believe, as I believe, that people without Jesus are going to hell? If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, you're, you're on the way to destruction. You're not on the way to life. That's, that's just what Jesus talks about. But Jesus also talks about that He's come that you might have life and have it to the full. That you can have the fullness of life for all eternity if we trust in Him. And trust in Him alone. So we, we are to be about prayerfully, lovingly winning lost people to Christ. You know, one of the sad, sad things that I've had is I've talked to people in different churches who've been Christians a long, long time, and they say to me, Robin, I've never shared my faith with you. And that kind of breaks my heart. Because, you see, healthy Christians, healthy people who are following Christ, are just part of the outreach team. We're all part of just reaching out to those around us with the love of Christ. We might not have the opportunity to lead someone to Christ, but we might be in the chain of somebody coming to Christ. So we want to help train people how to just be more effective witnesses, godly, loving witnesses to those around us. The church, for the most part, has been great at building up believers with lots of doctrine, lots of teaching, all of those kinds of things. But as we build believers... Part of the thing is we, we have to ask about production. Right? What's the fruit that's the result of our teaching? Or as I grew up and working on uh, my great uncle's dairy farm, I mean, the cows had to produce. right? And if they didn't produce, there was a truck that showed up. Right? Took them away. Right? And, you know, bossy, and cows that I grew up with, some of them disappeared, and a couple of them I had a nice steak from the year after. Because because there has to be fruit from our faith. There has to be fruit from our faith. And then we equip and train people to serve. We need to be workers in God's, God's domain. And uh, we are all, one, as we come and grow in our walk with Christ, we are to be sharing our faith. Yeah, we're to build up one another. We are to, to work and serve. 
And then God also multiplies leaders to multiply churches and multiply ministries. That's part of the strategy. The next slide is very interesting. We're going to get to the good stuff in a minute. Okay? There, there's some things that we've learned about churches. That slide's kind of wonky. It's better in your notes. You'll see it. But, um, you know, there are very small churches, and about 80% of churches in North America are between 50 and 99 in attendance. Do you know that? And all those churches, the, 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 the reason, the, the struggle they have is viability. How can they keep the lights on? How can they pay a pastor? All those kinds of things. There's struggles with that. There's small churches of 100 to 199. And uh, the, the, these, these churches are, are what I would call, the first church I would call is a clan church. It's kind of, it's, it's smaller. Everybody knows everybody else's name. And these small, these next level churches is about complacency because they can pay a pastor, they can do a lot of things. So it's very easy just kind of to stay that way. And then there's the, the mid-sized church, which we are, about 200 to 399, and it's regression. And so these churches tend to go through multiple life cycles, through pastors and through different things. They, they grow up for a while, and then their capacity restricts them. And then, as a result, if they don't move forward in some way, they, they tend to go backwards. And that's kind of where we are. And there's these other churches, too, that we don't really need to talk about today. How's that? So one of the exercises I did with the group, there was about 55. I invited about 75 people to this Friday night and Saturday. We, uh, and, uh, we talked about the life cycle of a church. Okay? So kind of picture it this way. And there will be a couple slides up there for, for some of you. But if, if you can look at it kind of like a bell curve, starting down here, like there's bird. There's childhood up in here. There's adolescence, right? There's kind of adulthood up around here, right? And then, you know, as we're moving along, there's maturity, and then people start kind of getting into the empty nest thing, and then there's retirement, and then there's old age, and then death. Because everyone in this room is on a life cycle. Did you know that right now? How many life cycles do you get on this earth? One. One. Okay. Now, you can be healthy as a person through all of that life cycle. The amazing thing that God did when He designed the church is that we, as a church, can have multiple life cycles. Isn't that exciting? Amen, Pastor Robin. Yeah, I get it. Right. So this church, this church has been going how long? Were any of you at the anniversary? 125 years now, right? Okay? So in this church, we've had some life cycles. And we can track them, actually, which is very interesting. So one of the things that I want you to understand, and, you know, Ben, just skip that one. That's not working for me today. But what it, because it's, it went wonky on me. It's not driving. But one of the things we have to understand is kind of where we are in our life cycle as a church. It's an important thing. See, when vision is strong, it's kind of driving the car. And relationships are right alongside it. And uh, then kind of, the, the, a church tends to kind of move up on the, the side of the life cycle where it's growing and kind of structures and ministries follow behind. But when structures and ministries start driving the church rather than vision and relationships, then a church starts falling into kind of the side of the life cycle that's just not healthy. And then they have a choice of what they need to do. They have to get back to Matthew 28, and they have to get back to Acts chapter 2. And they have to start really working through what God wants them to do in order for them 
to be renewed in their vision and ministry. What are the main ministry functions of a local church? They're found right in Acts chapter 2. They're evangelism and outreach, worship and prayer, teaching and proclamation, fellowship and care, service. And everyone who's a follower of Jesus Christ in this church is on each of these teams, whether you like it or not. You're on the outreach team. You're on the worship and prayer team. You're on the teaching and proclamation team. You're about fellowship and care, and you're about service. All of those things are to be functioning within our life. And we're going to do a mini-series on this in the next little while, a little bit later in the spring. Our strategy is the strategy of Jesus. If a church isn't following the strategy of Jesus, they miss out on the power, the presence, and, and the, the provision of God in their life. If they are not making disciples, they will not receive the power, presence, and the provision of Christ. Did you know that? Because Matthew 28 says it. I am with you always, Jesus says. When is He with us always? When we are making disciples. So I've been in churches that have said this to me. You know, Robin, the wonderful thing about our church is that we know everybody. And I go, that's not healthy. And they get mad at me for saying that. We know everybody. How long have you known everybody for? Oh, about 20 years. <laughs> then I ask, start asking a few other questions. How many new people have come to Jesus and been baptized in this church? And they go, well, that doesn't happen. Or they'll say something like this to me. We have the cleanest church in town. There are no, no marks on our walls. People have said this stuff to me. And I go, oh, that's because you don't have a kid like Justin in your congregation. <laughs> and they don't usually have any kid. They don't have any young people. And they haven't been seeing anybody come to Christ. But they know everybody. But in the healthiest churches, you don't know everybody. But you do know some people really well. Because you're in a ministry group or a life group. Whatever. That's where you get to know people. So you can't know everybody. In fact, Jesus demonstrates this in Acts for us. Because how many people did Jesus leave behind? Remember? 120. They've done studies about this. And that one leader can basically kind of shepherd maybe 120. And I know lots of shepherds who can't handle 120. Because we have to have many shepherds within the body of Christ in order for it to grow and to be healthy. So where was where did we find out where the Oxford life cycle was? Where were we? You know? This this disturbed us a little bit. Isn't that exciting? Isn't it to be disturbed spiritually? It's a good thing. So, the next slide, Ben, hopefully it kind of works. Um, I mean, we either start a new life cycle or we choose to die slow, gradual, painful death. And I'm giving you the illustration of the life cycle bell curve. So, are we at birth? Are we at the start of being a new church? Are we kind of at the child level? Are we, are we at the adolescent level? No. Are we at the adult level? Or the mature level? Yeah, we started tracking that a little bit. We, we're starting to find it a little bit. Right? Um, but we're not there. Uh, and, and, and it's interesting that the 55 people who filled out this kind of form that I had, we're pretty honest about it. I, I kind of like it. There's honesty in this congregation. So, so guess where we came out at? Are we dead? No, 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 no. We're 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 here. We're kind we're kind of at the, you know, 
the, the kind of, what they call it, the empty retire state of a church. Isn't that exciting? Some of you are not happy about that. I am. I am. Because God has us just where He wants us. Right now. For a reason. Some of you in your life are at the empty nest retirement stage. That's okay. As long as you're healthy in that, that's cool. But when a church starts is here, guess what needs to happen? What has to happen? I mean, we have a choice to make. We can have this long, drawn-out thing where we're sucking, you know, air and doing that kind of thing. What do you think needs to happen? A new life cycle has to start. That's what needs to happen. Isn't that cool? Isn't that great? Huh? This has happened before at Oxford Baptist Church. We can track it. We can track it. Sometimes it was a loss of a pastor and just different things that happened within the church. There was a renewed life cycle back in 1962, the year of my birth in this church. Okay? There was a lot of growth that happened in those years in there. Okay? There was some growth in the years kind of like 1898 to 1915. Then the war broke out. And then there were some things that happened. And that the church grew through those years. You can, you can see those kind of growth things. There's been some growth recently as well and just different things that have happened as, as pastors and, lead, and boards work together. So what needs to happen? Where are we going and by when? Why do we exist? We, we exist to make disciples. So we have to renew something. I mean, what are the five to seven core ministry values that we need to have to move us ahead? There's a slogan on the outside coming in that says this. A relationship that changes what? Everything. And uh, I was really excited in the last half hour of our time together on that particular Saturday, someone kind of stopped us in our tracks and said, well, who's the relationship with? Right? <coughs> who's the relationship with? Is it with Mike, our custodian? Okay. Is it with Pastor Robin? If you have a relationship with Pastor Robin, everything changes. Well, it does for some people, but not for everybody else. Okay? Will a relationship with Justin Trudeau change everything? No, you know what? We clarified that statement. And I think it was a very important clarification. Because this sets us up for mission. This is the mission of our church back in 1890. A relationship with Jesus Christ changes everything. He does or he doesn't? I believe he does. And then what are our ministry priorities to see this happen? What is our big vision that God wants us to have? Well, the first thing that we came up with was this. I love the wording. And you've got to remember, the pastor didn't come up with this stuff. The 55 people who were working together clarified this and wrestled with it those days and hours. And it's exciting what they came up with. Because they all line up with Matthew 28 and Acts chapter 2. And they're kind of Oxford's deep. To help us build on a relationship with Jesus Christ that changes everything. Here's the first one. It's about the worship and prayer category. It's honor God by seeking and treasuring Him together. Honor God by seeking and treasuring Him together. Or just a little caption that you can remember. Some of you will get tattoos of this on your body. I know that. Just honor and treasure God. I mean, we want to glorify God in everything we do. But 
And, and part of that, we just want to honor God through our worship and treasure who He is. And be so focused on who He is that He will just transform our life and our thinking. <coughs> our today and our tomorrow. The second one is kind of the outreach and evangelism component of Matthew 20 and Acts 2. Go and share the gospel for kingdom impact. Go and share the gospel for kingdom impact. Go and share. We, you know, we have some young adults who are going off and sharing the gospel. And we like that when we send our young people away overseas somewhere. And some parents like that too, I guess. <laughs> but the other thing that we need to realize is that all of us who know Jesus Christ here today are part of the outreach and evangelism team at Oxford. Your witness counts. Either you're a good witness and a happy witness about Jesus, or you're one of these grumpy dudes that I just like to kind of put up against the wall and say, listen, you need to change now. Your attitude is wrong. Right? You need to have a fresh encounter with Jesus again. Because joy comes into your life when you encounter Jesus. Right? And we're to go and share. Right, the, the next one that, that we have here is just on our discipleship or the Word of God. Where we equip God's people to know and respond to God's Word. I love this too because part of what we're trying to do is equip, equip each other to, to be the best followers of Jesus Christ we can be through God's Word and listening to His Holy Spirit. That's our response. So it's equip God's people. And then there's fellowship, care, and compassion. That's the next one. Where we cultivate authentic community that, notice this, serves with joy and compassion. <coughs> Do you like that one? Wouldn't it be great that all through Oxford County, people would know people from this church? Because we just serve with joy and compassion. Isn't that great? And, I mean, that's at the, the essence of how Jesus served the broken. And as Jesus sent the 72 out in, in uh, Luke chapter 10, they came back and it says Jesus was full of joy. Because right? we have to cultivate this authentic community in Christ. So what is the bottom line for any church? Do you think? What do you think the bottom line is? For some churches, it's attendance, buildings, and cash, ABC. Okay? Things are important, but yeah, we need money to, to run ministry, those kinds of things. We need a building to be in, and hopefully people attend stuff. But I want to change that. That's got to be DEF, Discipleship, Evangelism, and Faith. Because when, when I look at the Scriptures, Paul and the Apostles are always discipling people. Jesus was discipling people. They were reaching out, and they had incredible faith to do it. Incredible faith. See, the bottom line for any church is this. It's not, not having marks on the walls, or trying to know everybody. Because you can't. I mean, I was in a church of 50 people. And uh, I asked the two deacons that were left in the church. I said, so how long do you guys know each other? Well, 55 years. I said, have you ever been in his home? Or you been in his home? Never. <laughs> have you guys ever gone out for coffee together and hung out? No, why would we do that? <laughs> I'm going, they're in trouble. They're in trouble. Because the bottom line for any church is change lives through the